I say, since we have two thirds of the people that have registered, or about the three quarters, I'm going to start. Hanakoto Katua, thank you for coming. And I want to thank you all for attending our inaugural Lunch and Learn session. Um, I'm Dr. Lisa Sirup, and I'm president of Hearing New Zealand. Um, and as I said, I've already introduced Catherine, who is the brains behind the technical support for all of the Lunch and Learn. So it's no good having the ability with, or the, the ideas without the ability to implement them. Um, Lunch and Learn is our launch for the World Hearing Awareness Day, which will be March 3rd. Hearing New Zealand uses the white cat as our unity symbol, making the invisible visible. Um, and because white cats are, have such fabulous compensatory skills that often you don't know they have a hearing loss unless you actually test them. Uh, white cats are also unapologetically uh, uh, <laughs> believe, their unapologetic belief that they are perfect and the way they are is also an inspiration. Harana was asked to be our first speaker for her work in the field of molecular bi biology, which actually fits into that white cat theme as our launch. She has amazing presentation skills and has an unapologetic vision in the field of auditory and vestibular neuroscience. And we are very pleased and honored that she has accepted our invitation, and I will turn it over to her. Oh, great, thank you so much, Lisa. Now I hope everyone can hear me and also see the mouth, my mouse cursor. So I'd like to start by thanking Lisa and Catherine and uh, hearing New Zealand team. Uh, it's, it's really, I'm really excited to be here today uh, to greet and meet members of hearing New Zealand and associated organizations. So it's really my great pleasure here today uh, and honor to give this very first talk for the Lunch and Learn Seminar Series. So I'm a, a researcher based in Auckland and um, I am a molecular biologist interested in the inner ear biology. So for today's talk, uh, Lisa has asked me to talk, cover a little bit about genes and the genetics behind the hearing loss. So that's what I hope to cover today um, in, in my title, uh, in the talk. So um, I might just uh, get this started. Sorry. <clears throat> so when we talk about here, you know, where do we hear and where is the ear? Uh, often people really think about this outer part of the ear uh, on the surface of face to really be the ear, and that's what kids will point out. But for those of us involved in hearing-related field or hearing health or be interested in hearing health, know that there's so much more um, beyond this, uh, what the visible part of the ear and um, the other parts that we all see is actually, matter of fact, called outer ear. But beyond the eardrum, we have a lot of small machinery in the middle ear. And further in, toward, inwards, towards the, our, at the head, uh, in, along our auditory system, we have the inner ear. Now, the schematic diagram here represents how uh, that is it's a pathway for hearing system. So we know that sound is really a vibration of the ear in the space. And as the sound arrives to the ear canal, uh, it travels down the ear canal and hit, the, you know, hit our eardrum or the tympanic membrane and causes the vibration uh, of the eardrum, which in turn vibrates the little bones in our middle ear space. Until this vibration arrives to the most inner part here, uh, called the inner ear. And again, it causes the oscillation inside the inner ear. So all the way down along the ear canal to the inner ear, in this blue pathway here, the sound is traveling as a physical uh, vibration. Now then, the magic happens in the inner ear. So in the inner ear, this vibration is converted into an electrical signal that can then travel down the nerve and reaches the brain. So sound as an electrical signal is something that our brain can interpret and can go, oh, ha-ha, we hear something. 
So this part in the center, the inner ear, is really the magic box that converts the physical sound into an electrical signal that we can com all comprehend. Now, if this conversion machinery in the inner ear stops working, uh, that's what causes the sensory neuronal hearing loss. So for the rest of my talk, I'll be focusing primarily in the inner ear. <coughs> Sorry. Now, the inner ear um, is responsible for both our hearing and balance. And the part of our inner ear that is responsible for hearing is called the cochlea. The name cochlea actually means snail. And this is what the snail we have in our inner ear. So the picture in the middle is a photograph of a human cochlea taken in our laboratory. And you can see this snail-like structure or the spiral uh, quite clearly uh, in this human cochlea photograph. Now, the actual thing is about the size of jelly bean. So we literally have a tiny shell uh, inside our head. Now, this hearing system looks a little bit like the piano diagram on the right there. An analogy there is that uh, our hearing spiral works in a way that one part of the spiral is responsible for a particular tune. So high tune or the low tune. And um, that's what this structure really represents. So how does our hearing system work? How does this spiral work? Now, if we take a cross section at one point of this spiral, what you see is an um, empty tube. As a matter of fact, you see a three hollow tubes. And if we zoom into the central portion of these tubes, uh, it's, it looks like a diagram here. Now, it's a little bit complicated diagram. And what you see is that these little divisions here, sorry, the little division here represent single cell. So we have a many, many, many cells uh, in this, in the purple ones, in yellow ones, in orange ones. So they're all cells working together in the center of the cochlea. Now this central portion is called the organ of corti, and this is the part of the cochlea responsible for sensing the sound. Now, one thing that is really quite important is this hollow tube with organ of corti inside. It's actually filled with fluid. So all the blue bits contains water. So as the sound arrives at the inner ear, it causes oscillation of this fluid that travels like the wave. And that wave moves this whole organ of corti up and down along with this jelly-like part of the organ of corti. And that oscillation or the movement uh, is sensed by the organ of corti as the arrival of the sound. <clears throat> so this diagram um, contains quite a few different uh, complicated picture of the cells. Uh, but out of this organ of corti, I am going to focus on three different cellular structures uh, that are really quite critical uh, for us to be able to hear the sound. <clears throat> so the first of the three components that I'm going to introduce, uh, the cell is called hair cells. Now, they are the critical sensor for the hearing system. So which ones are they? So hair cells are the ones that are highlighted in purple in this diagram. So it sits in the middle of that organ of corti. And uh, in the middle here is the actual microscopic image of the organ of corti. So hopefully you can see like a similar curves to the lift here. So this bit is about this bit. And Hair cells are pointed by the arrows here. Now, our cochlea has two types of hair cells called the inner and outer. But the important thing is where the, what the, this hair cell name means. 
So if we magnify into this one single hair cell, uh, this is how each of them look. So just as the name hair cell uh, represent, these cells have a hair-like structure sticking on its head, and we call them stereocilia. But these hairs are able to move around as the sound wave arrive at the cochlea. And these hairs are capable of detecting a movement as small as nanometer scales. So this is a sensing machinery for the sound. Now we can see these hairs under, uh, under the microscope uh, if, we, if we use the, the right preparation. So you, as you can see in the picture here, uh, we really have a hair sticking on the cell and that's the sensor for sound. The second component I'd like to introduce are the auditory neurons, and they work as a wire for the sound information to travel to the brain. So auditory neurons in this diagram are the ones highlighted by yellow, and they are very, very specialized neurons, uh, specialized to pass the information as fast as possible to the brain, so we don't have any delay in receiving the sound to actually hearing the sound. Now, if we zoom into one part, so the purple one is the sensor that I just talked about with the hair, and the neuron is down on the bottom. So neuron is reaching out, almost touching the sensor, and receives the sound information from the hair cell. On the right is the actual microscopic image, so it's the actual picture of how neurons look. Uh, so green is a really quite long arms coming out of the neuron. And the red bit, oh, I lost my cursor, sorry, is the hair cell. And cell body of the neuron looks like this. So we have a specialized wire to carry the sound information to the brain. The third component that I'd like to introduce is not neuron or the sensor. So it doesn't sound as exciting, but it's actually really, really important, especially for genetics of hearing loss. And these guys are called fibrocytes in supporting cells. And these are the cells um, highlighted in orange in this schematic diagram. So we actually have many of them uh, on and beside the organ of corti. What they do is that these cells together make very special fluid in the central part of the organ of corti. Very different type of fluid that you won't find in other part of the body. And this fluid works as a battery to allow hair cells to sense the sound. Now, just like any other electronic devices, uh, sensor and neuron can't function without the battery. So what these cells do to generate the battery for the cochlea is incredibly important uh, for our hearing system. <clears throat> so that's the three main components of the hearing system, sensors, neurons, and the battery component. And all these structures exist along the entire length of the cochlea. So on the right picture here, the green actually shows where the organ of corta is um, and hair cells. So we have about 15,000 of them in one human cochlea. So all these three components beautifully aligned along that snail-like spiral develops from much shorter term during the development. And everything develops sort of in a synchrony so they can develop together and talk to each other all ready to start hearing sound well before birth. And this sophisticated system that develops beautifully, uh, what orchestrates this process are the genes in our DNA. So now I'd like to shift the change the topic a little bit and get into the genetics. But I'll start by explaining what we mean by genes. Now, um, virtually all cells in our body, and we have a trillions of them in total throughout our body, but virtually all cells in our body contain DNA. And DNA is a blueprint for the makeup of our body. Now, DNA is the strip 
of code written using four letters, A, G, T, C. And it's already long, but you may have seen some diagram like this in the middle here. So DNA is often packaged uh, into a structure called chromosomes. But it's a really, really long piece of DNA. And in a human DNA, if you stretch it all out, apparently it's about 1.8 meters long with 3, 3 billion letters long. So it's incredibly, incredibly long code uh, that carries all the information about our body's makeup. Now, what the term gene means is a gene is a section of DNA. And by historical definition, one gene is, uh, uh, is a section that is responsible for uh, making a one protein. So one gene is a recipe pretty much for making one type of protein in general. And protein made based on the information on a gene are the ones that carries out all the important things for our cells to live. Now, um, along the 3 billion liters long DNA, uh, the, a huge amount of variation exists between people because we are all different, you know, everything about each of us is different. And normally that genetic variation does not cause any problem. Uh, but in a rare occasion, uh, some variation can have some problems or cause some problems. And one of the example is hearing loss. So how often does genetic variation cause hearing loss? Now, when something like a hearing loss has genetic cause, because we inherit part of our DNA, half from one parent and the other half from the other parent, our families share like quite a large amount of DNA. So when there's a genetic cause of hearing loss, uh, you tend to see it uh, in the families uh, as an inherited form of hearing loss. So that's one characteristic. Another part is that uh, you often develop an early hearing loss, much, much earlier uh, than you would expect. So in extreme cases, when a baby is born with profound hearing loss at birth, about 50% of these cases are thought to be due to genetic causes. And approximately 80% of the case, prelingual cases, are the developed thereafter. So if you think about you know, notifications for deafness uh, in New Zealand database, you can imagine quite a large proportion of those reported cases to have a genetic causes of some sort. Now, currently, there are more than 120 genes associated with hearing loss and over 6,000 gene variants reported as potential cause for hearing loss. And I'll elaborate on those uh, using the next example. So now I'd like to um, showcase three example cases of uh, genetic hearing loss. And the first one is uh, really the first case to be characterized, uh, most common and most well studied. And this is called DFNB1. Now, this is a very common form, uh, and um, I show two family tree here. And I'd just like to highlight that this study uh, was conducted by a research group in Dunedin um, and includes some report of DFNB1 hearing loss in New Zealand families. So this paper is published in 1995. But essentially, um, and here's two examples here. So we have a mum and, mom and dad, and along the seven siblings here, three of them developed hearing loss quite early in their life. And in the second family, both siblings developed hearing loss. So there's multiple cases of hearing loss within a family uh, at a young age. Uh, now, DFNB1 is very common, and some statistics um, think that it's about 40% of familial cases, non syndromic cases. Now, when this kind of cases were reported, um, people conducted a DNA analysis. And by comparing DNA makeup of the people who were affected and who were not affected, 
they actually found some common difference between the people. And matter of fact, they found a location in DNA on chromosome 13, which had a variation which was seen in the people with hearing loss, but not in people without the hearing loss. To, to be. Now, this part of the DNA uh, received the name called DFNB1. And this is also the name that we refer this, these people's hearing loss cases to. So initially, uh, DFNB1 refers to this locus. We call it locus um, of, on the DNA. So DFNB1 for us uh, is a little bit like a street address, um, street address on the map of the DNA. Uh, so it points to a specific location where variation uh, in this family of hearing loss uh, people with patients were um, found. Now, later on, a lot of research unveiled so much more new knowledge about the DNA and genes, and many genes received the common generic names. And it turns out this location, DFNB1, uh, houses a gene, and this gene is named GJB2. So GJB2 is the name of a gene that's in that DFN, a DFNB1 locus. Now the complication starts here first further. So GJB2 gene uh, on this DNA strip is actually really long. Uh, matter of fact, it's 5,000 letters long. And variation within any of the 5,000 letters could cause a variation that causes a hearing loss. It may not. So just because you have a variation or variant affecting DFNB1, it uh, doesn't mean it's all the same. And matter of fact, there are more than 200 different we call variants or different type of variation reported for the FNB1. So taking this question further, so what did then some scientists find about how this causes a hearing loss ex exactly? And now I'm going to link back to the battery component here. So it turns out that JJB2 is a gene. It's a blueprint and a recipe for a protein called Connexin 26. Now, Connexin 26 is a protein that's found in supporting cells. And we now know this to be very, very important for supporting cells to make this special solution that works as a battery for the cochlea. So in DFNB1 patient, what happened is that the variation in GJB2 gene caused change to connexin 26 that supporting cells could no longer make this fluid. So we lost the battery in the hearing system. Now this is shown here is a picture of one of a DFNB1 model in animal model. And um, you, know, you can see that uh, the rough structure of organ of quarter is, is pretty much looking normal. So at the early stage, there's no serious devastation of the cochlea as you might expect from deafness. But we have our hair cells, we have the neurons, but we simply don't have the battery for them to function properly. So DFNB1 really uh, the problem starts as a cochlear battery component being not functional. So that's one very well studied example um, of DFNB1. Now I've introduced one example. I want to show two other examples that has quite a different uh, picture. So second example is DFNB9. And this location has a gene called OTOF, OTOF gene. And OTOF gene, um, so DFNB9 causes prolingual deafness typically. And OTOF gene is a blueprint for a protein called otoferlin. Now, when people studied this gene and produced DFNB9 model, left is a normal cochlea and right is the DFNB9 model. Now, this animal is completely deaf like the other, the other model. Uh, but again, the cochlea looks normal. So what's going on there? 
Now, it turns out that autoferrin protein is very important for communication between the hair cell, our sensor, and neuron, the wire. And it sits on a hair cell between at, at this uh, communication spot. So the, in DFNB9 patient, autoferrin gene variation causes uh, malfunction of this autoferrin protein. So hair cells and neuron can no longer communicate with each other. And that means no signal can be sent to the brain, causing deafness, profound hearing loss. <clears throat> so in this type of, in this particular genetic hearing loss, uh, what research showed is that autoferrin is really important for the communication between the sensor and wire, and DFNB9 is really a cochlear wire level problem. Another ex different example, so next one is DFNB7 and 11, and this locus uh, contains another gene called TMC1. And this gene, TMC1, is a blueprint for a protein with the same name, TMC1 protein. Now, this is obviously a very important gene because more than 100 likely variants that can cause hearing loss in people have already been reported. And the same gene, TMC1, is also responsible for some, some uh, DFNA uh, cases as well. And what research has now showed is that um, TFNF TMC1 protein is found in a sticky, on the tip of the hair of the hair cell, our sensor. Now, in this particular case, uh, when they generated a model of the FNB7, first of all, the hair cell was um, alteration or very different. Uh, TMC1 on the tip, and they couldn't sense the sound as they should be able to. Uh, and over time, it had some detrimental impact on the health of the hair cells themselves. So we lost some senses. So across is a missing part of the hair cells. So this example, DNFB7 and 11, is really the sound sensor problem. So just wrapping it all together, so I introduced three examples uh, out of over 120 genes known so far to associate, be associated with hearing loss. And all three cases were very different, as you saw. One was sensor problem, one was a wire problem, and the other was a battery problem. And that applies to all other remaining 120 genes. So I highlighted just a several um, examples from no 120 genes. So a group of them would affect, cause a sensor problem, like in pink here. Uh, other groups will cause wire problem. And there's others that will cause the battery problem, like the three examples that I shared. So what this really means is that genetics of hearing loss is really quite complicated. And not all gene variations cause the same problem. Uh, no matter of fact, each gene does very different things. To be really honest, we expect that there are many, many more variants and genes for hearing loss to be yet to be discovered uh, by further research. But I'd like to just highlight the fact that all these 100 genes, 20 genes, are known to be associated with hearing loss and are really important for cochlea. We know what we know now, thanks to all these clinical reports uh, from the clinicians and families about familiar cases of, familial cases of hearing loss, and then the follow-up effort to really understand what was causing the hearing loss in these families. And that has not only found these 120 genes that causes hearing loss, but it really further um, contributed to our understanding of how our hearing system works in the first place. So moving towards the future. Now, um, this week we actually had, um, it's um, having a conference called ARO, ARO. 
in the United States virtually, and there are a lot of exciting research uh, coming out from uh, research groups all, all over the world around new upcoming therapies. And that definitely targets some gene therapies for deafness genes. So I just showed a few examples here. So GJB2, DFMP1 is one, was one of the examples uh, of the battery problem one. And five different companies are uh, trying to develop a gene therapy for this particular hearing loss. Uh, another example, the autofurring one, the wire problem one, uh, the four companies are trying to develop um, the uh, therapies for this hearing loss. Now, all these uh, research is still mostly at the preclinical level, so early stage, uh, but understanding the genetic cause of hearing loss um, could lead to new therapies. And it has come a long way since DFNB1 was first uh, really um, understood in 1994. But hopefully things will accelerate from this point onwards. <clears throat> So now just uh, on the finishing remark, uh, so, and we are already 12.30. Now I hope uh, in this quite a brief walkthrough, I hope I managed to highlight some of the complexity uh, and really diversity about genetics behind the hearing system. And, um, and I think hearing loss is really currently like a fruit basket. So, you know, we have a fruit basket and we call it all fruit, but individual fruit is all very different. And I think that's the case with the hearing loss. We sort of talk about hearing loss as a condition uh, and we talk about severity and we talk about conductive or versus sensory neural, but it's actually a lot more complex than that. There are genetic causes, aging causes, are different causes cause different type of hearing, um, hearing loss. And just on the genetics, we just saw that there are so many different causes and versions of genetic hearing loss. Even worse, many of these factors uh, interact with each other, uh, just to complicate our picture. But moving forward uh, to develop better treatment for hearing loss or diagnostic, diagnostics or management for hearing loss, it really requires us to take the fruit basket apart uh, and understand and deepen our understanding about the unique cases of hearing loss and really come to the personal uh, particular hearing loss and further our understanding. Hmm. Um, now I work in the lab and I look at the microscope, but I don't look down people's ear canal and I certainly don't see people. So for taking this further to, um, work on this and um, understanding hearing loss further at each level, I think it requires a lot of communication uh, between clinicians, community, uh, people who experience hearing loss and researchers from many different backgrounds. So I really think this type of forum that Lisa has, and Lisa has organized with here in New Zealand uh, to talk about um, various aspects of hearing loss is really quite a tremendous opportunity. So we as a common hearing uh, research community in New Zealand can talk, uh, bounce ideas, uh, share our perspectives and understandings um, towards the future. So now I'd just like to uh, acknowledge and introduce the lab group I belong to. So I'm part of an auditory and vestibular translational neuroscience cluster, and that's a long name, but we're basically the hearing and balance research group uh, based at the University of Auckland. And we have amazing research PIs, PhD students, and many students uh, on board in the group. And we all work on different projects. Um, and some of the research topic ongoing includes um, trying to figure out the best way to deliver some of these future treatment to the hearing system. So if you're interested in you know, hearing more about what we do as a research topic, please feel free to contact us. Uh, we are all in Auckland. And after, after hopefully after this whole COVID uh, Omicron saga is over, um, some of us will maybe even meet, even meet in person. Uh, but I would really love um, to hear from anyone who was in the audience today who would like to know more about our research or would like to provide their perspective uh, to us. 
you know, just acknowledge the funding agents that support all our work at the research cluster. Um, and also we are part of the ALS Elmore Center uh, for the coordinated hearing research. So thank you everyone so much for joining this forum and listening to my talk. And I'll pass it back to you, Lisa. Thank you, Verona. I very much enjoyed that. There has been a couple questions from the chat, and if anybody wants to raise their hand to ask questions, please do so now. Or if you put, want to 